right back to the same house. We went right back to the same apartment. And uh, late on that evening, my brother came over. I told him what happened. He said, no big issue. I got $1,000 for you. That was my first cop. That I copped it that night and got busted the next day. I had made a penny back off. I had made some money, maybe two or $300, but I never distributed it out anywhere or took it and paid anybody off with it. So my brother showed back up, said so he got me on a thousand. Then fly guy brother showed back up and said, I heard what happened to y'all, here go a pound. He had it already out in the car. He said, y'all still in the game? We said, yeah, we still in the game. He went out, here go the pound of weed. We told him to come back later on that night. We had the money for him. He showed back up, my brother had bought a thousand. I got a pound of weed, thousand dollars cash, paid him his money. And the next day, my clientele had shot up to like $2,500 that they had made us the man when they raided that spot. They gave us the recognition that we was big enough for the for uh, for them to come down from 1,300 Bobian to bust us. I mean, man, it was so many customers out there the next day. It was a shame. Just we, just we. We sold. I, matter of fact, we sold that pound. We sold out the next day. Sold out the next day. Sold out the next day after that. Sold out the next day where we couldn't even keep enough weed in there. Matter of fact. And so uh, my brother did, they switched his mail route to over there where I was at. And while he was on his mail route on Newport, this Jew couple wanted to get out the neighborhood because it was becoming dominant black, my dominant black uh, residents. And they pretty much gave it to my brother. We, we didn't watch TV, for real. We didn't hear a whole lot about what was going on around us. It was just that we was focused on what we was doing. We was real popular in the neighborhood with everybody. Even, even we won our neighbors over, how we won our neighbors over one day where uh, it had rained. And when it rained, the whole street was flooded. And what we did were we tracked, we went and found the sewage drain. We went in there and poured all the sticks out the sewage drain. Then the water eventually drained off. We went and bought some shovels and went down the side of the sidewalk and got all of the mud up. After that raid, and they let Fly Guy go that night, once again, we just blew up again. I mean, customers from everywhere. From I didn't know anything about Gross Point, didn't care anything about Gross Point. I just know they was young white kids, basically my age or younger, wanted some weed, we'll knock, on the door. knock on the door. Hey man, let them in. We want to smoke a joint, they buy some weed, smoke a joint with me, and we kick it. And then they told me they was going to come back the next day at lunchtime, and will it be okay for them to bring one of their friends with them? Boom, no problem. Eventually, hell, my house was full of them. I didn't know they was rich, you know, until, you know, my brother even mentioned to me one day, he said, did you know this was like, say, the chief of police daughter or son or the doctor or, or this lawyer? Yes, and they were spending it, man. They was just coming right in the door. Like sometime, hell, if I had seven, eight hundred dollars of weed, they would just buy it themselves. And yeah, and then I went and bought this uh, this big hooker. Stood about maybe three feet in the air, had it like five, or six holes on it. They'd pull like the kettles down in the bottom of it, man, and and just pack that motherfucker full of weed and lightning. And we all sitting back hitting it and choking. I had never even heard of the word cocaine. I heard Big T mention it before. And also, he had freebased in front of us before. Wow. Yeah, he freebased, and, and he even offered it to us, and we was like, no, we don't, what is that? You know, and Fly Guy had already told me he had tried some uh, angel dust before, and he never wanted to try that ever again because it was just, just too much. So, uh, man, hell, uh, I mean, we was just uh, having a ball over there. No, I never feel like I was the boss, because me and Fly Guy was pretty much like family. You know, I lived in Lee Grange, Arkansas. He lived in Rundo, Arkansas, which was right across from each other with the plan that we can't run it all day and night together. So he would work 12-hour shift, and I would work a 12-hour shift. And then we'll switch it up. If he need to take the day off and I work the day, and then he come in at night, we'll do that. We was going so back and forth. Then we used to let him come to the front door. Then we started making them go around to the back because it would just be too much traffic, too many people on our front porch. The neighborhood was very stable at that time. It was some vacant lots too. It was some vacant lots, but they kept them clean. What me and Fly Guy came up with 
what we would do since you could never really see in my apartment except the living room. You could never really see in the dining room. What we started doing, we did this for maybe only about four or five days. We did this for about four or five days straight. When I would open the door, or vice versa, when he opened the door, I would talk to the customer for a minute, and he'll come around the corner with pistols in his hand or a shotgun and just kind of like, look, look, like, and then just go back. In other words, if you was to hand me up at the door, you would never know that this guy gonna come around the corner with a gun. And I would do the same thing, you know, let fly guy answer the door, and I come around with 38s in my hand, you know, look at the customer. They were like, hey, oh, hey, BJ, I didn't know you was in there. Like, yeah, I'm just sitting back here, man. Glad you stopped by, and I just go back. Yeah, well, my brother ended up getting this place from the Jew. It was on Newport between Jefferson and uh, Kirchville, 1261 and uh, pretty much gave it to us, it was a nice home. And my brother knew the people to stall armor, armor gates. We put it all around the windows, at least the lower, the lower flat, the, the armor doors on it and everything. And they was doing their little thing, but they was dealing in hair run. Cause I was making more money selling weed than people were selling hair run at that time. Why did you guys Yeah, it was a lot of people selling marijuana at that time. What made you good at it? But it wasn't a lot of them at our age. That was the thing. We were pretty much the youngest ones in the game. However, what kept us in the game were, was Fly Guy family, who had all the supply. marijuana supplied. Nisi family, who had all the pills. I remember we, I we took Fly Guy, it was Fly Guy going to work that day. We went over there that day. I mean, that was the first day I even seen the place myself. So my dumb ass, I put a sign in the window of my apartment on Drexel. I'm no longer here. I'm at 1261 Newport at the weed spot. So we over there on, at 1261 Newport. I'm like, man, this is a nice house, blue, 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 blue. And Fly Guy was telling me it was something wrong with the bathroom or something. And I said, I'm going to shoot to the corner to the hardware store and get maybe some Ajax and some house cleaning product. And I'll be right back and my brother was with me. We got in the car, drove just a block up the street to Jefferson, Jefferson in Newport, which was Chalmers, just a block over Lakewood Chalmers. Went in there, got the supplies, made the block and came back. All the windows was tore out the, the house. The gates was outside, the bars was poured down and everything. And I was like, what the hell happened? And a little kid was on the porch and said, the police just left here and they took your friend to jail. They had the new address just that quick. They had a warrant to hit that spot. Instead of hitting that spot, they just swung on around the corner and hit that one. No, I didn't really have a whole lot in there. I had some pills in there and just a little mere warning. And, uh, and when I went in there, well, guys were selling pills too. we had some pills too. Teas, blues, Imprims, Somas, Volumes, Dilatas, Pollutants. We pretty much had anything else. A person would want. But not cocaine. Not cocaine. Who was the connect for the pills? Nisi family was to connect for the pills. So I had plenty of them, you know, and it just started off. The strange thing about this, I, it was never my intention of selling pills. I used to loan them money. I had plenty of cash, cash flow coming in. They would stop by, hey, BJ, uh, can we get 200? Hey, give you 200. Where in the morning, I would have at least five to six family members that would be at my door borrowing money. They would just tell me what their request was, 150, 200, 300, I just peel it off to them. And later on that day when they sell their pills and get their money back, they would pay me. And sometimes, like Nisi mom, I was like, you are right, you ain't gotta pay me whatever the situation may be. But it was a customer guest kept coming. He kept saying, man, let me get some weed, man. I gotta smoke me some weed. Uh, the pill house is out. I'm like, the pill house is out. I said, what is you trying to get? And he told me what is he can. I said, man, I get that all day, man. I, you know, me trying to be the big fella. I said, man, I get, he said, man, if you was to sell that, man, he, you said you would make boo cool. You know, was what? Was teas and blues. Oh, that was to make up for heroin, right? Yeah, that was to make up for heroin, yeah. And I didn't really realize Talwin it. Heroin and something. Yeah. So they were pills once? Yeah, it was pills. Well, it was like more. a heroin drug, so you could take this something called tell when they were teas and the blues or something. Yeah, the blues is what. Yeah. Sort of like taking heroin. Yeah, yeah, it was like a, 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 that was the combo to it. 
the blues you can get from anywhere. The doctors easily give you, it was the teas that you have a problem yeah. with. So I had them all though. And so, uh, but to get back to the story on, on, on Newport, when we swung around, I had some pills in the house because when I looked in the sink, I seen one of them in the sink, but they was melted down. It was melted down, he had put water on it. And I said, shit, they got fly guy again. again. <laughs> That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Got fly guy again. They call him G-Man. G-Man. Yeah, That's he got that name in prison. Newport. It was a little different because they never even came in the house at all. That we always kept them outside until we eventually built a wall inside also. And so, uh, and so, during this time there. I had plenty of cash, man. I mean, we was comfortable. Everything was just flowing so you smooth. You guys hanging out much at downtown? Not you just in your own little world. So in our own world. We kings, partied. Kings of the East. Uh, that well, that's little, exactly what it was. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. We was king in our own little world. You know, we had all the women, white women, black women, young, old. It didn't matter. We had them in there. And, uh, and so one day when we was in there sitting, no, it wasn't even no big issue with them. You know, it was never a big issue with them. You're like giving them a 25 right now. Yeah, I'd give him $1,000 and he'd tell me he could pay me. He, and a lot of times he couldn't pay me. He'd come back, say, man, I know I owe you this and that. You know, I need to borrow some money. And I would give it to him again. I was like, man, it's not no big issue. I always told him, not a big issue, not a big issue. Pretty much I was doing him like Big T was doing us. It was never a big issue. What's scary to me, it was just jamming up outside. That's what was scary to me. My weed clientele was jamming up. The crack cocaine was jamming up. And then oh, the, you had the same, you were selling everything out of the same house. Out of the same house. I was selling everything out of the same house. And what happened were the cocaine customers started robbing the white customers from Gross Point. So the kids who were coming for weed started getting robbed by the crackheads. Yes, started getting robbed by a crackhead. So we had to tell them. We sell them. We no longer sell one. Community service. <laughs> Community announcement. Have you, have you heard? I, mean, I think the, the like the the street mythology, at least that I've come across, was that you guys were. I mean, obviously you were getting it from someone, but that a lot of the crack renaissance kind of started with on the east side with you know your crew and, and Matt. Well, you know what? Uh, or did you know of other people that there were? I mean, there were because if people were freebasing from the late seventies, they were freebasing, but they didn't have any houses. I'm about crack. I'm about no, crack. I don't. Yeah, yeah, they were freebasing, but no one actually had a house that they were selling out of, because one of the weed customers, his name was Tim. He was a young guy, and whenever I couldn't find weed from other suppliers, I should go over to his house, which he stayed on Philip, off of Jefferson, and. He started showing up buying it and smoking it, and he still was selling weed. So I was like, damn, he smoked it too? You know, so a lot of people, twin, run and done, they was coming. They sold it, and they was buying it. I was like, man, it's kind of strange. So the people who was out there getting money weren't really selling it or staying in business long enough to sell it. Oh, because they were getting turned out on it. Getting turned out on it, yes. Could you tell from right from the beginning this was like a new kind of, this wasn't, yes. this, this drug this was a new level of addiction. This wasn't business as usual. That's right. This wasn't business as usual. It wasn't. You know, because it was bringing everybody out. It was bringing peoples out that you wouldn't even imagine was would smoke crack. And you was like, and these women were so beautiful. You know, they were still healthy looking, still doing nine to five, you know, pulling up in they, you know, they nice cars, you know. Uh, about when they started partying, they called yeah, yeah so, that eventually so came, yeah. So, so how yeah. long did it take before things kind of, you realize like, wow, this is, like it seemed like you were a pretty, you're just a laid back guy, you came up here just enjoying life and getting into selling weed. It's easy, you're not hurting nobody. Now this new thing comes, and like you said, they're robbing the weed customers, then people are pawning stuff. At what point did you make you the decision that... of, okay, I'm involved in something that's a little more destructive, but fuck it, the money is You know what? You, you know what? It never it never appeared destructive to me because everybody was still normal was looking. Everybody was still maintaining. 
you know, we was in there and uh, and uh, and then I had hired my brother, David, to start working for me. And uh, and I remember I went to sleep. And when I woke up, he woke me up. He said, man, we out. And when I say we was out, I had just bought 20,000 in the house. And I said, we out. So you out of these little houses, you could sell 20,000 in a day. Oh, we had houses, man, sell 30, 40, 50,000. So people, that wasn't just people coming and buying a dime. People are coming Not, and that's spending right. hundreds of dollars. Some of them would spend a thousand, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars. It's a smoke. No, to sell. They would take oh, it. Oh, you had, you had. They was coming back buying and to even sell okay, themselves. So, so talk about, okay, now this is where I want to tie into the, this bigger stuff I'm talking about with this America. Talk about, you know, going from paying twenty five hundred an ounce to how, what prices, and was it weird? Or like, talk about how you saw the cocaine prices drop and how you started to get bigger cocaine suppliers. Okay, what happened was, during that day I was just speaking, when I had bought about 20,000 in the house, and my brother David had woke me up and said we was out. I went in the bedroom and seen all this fucking money. And I said, damn, let me get this money up out of here. So I took a garbage bag and just raked all the fucking money in the garbage bag, man. And the garbage bag was half full because I it wasn't put together. I took it, threw it, uh, threw it in my truck, and I took off. I went, I went up Newport to Kirchhoff. I made a left on Kirchhoff. And when I got to uh, Dickerson and Kirchhoff, it was a line of police cars right there. They were headed. Heading that way. And I didn't know it. I said, damn. They kind of looked at me, too. They looked at me. In the car, I kind of looked at like them. your first raid at the weed spot. Yeah, looked at them, and the light changed, and they just started barreling through there. And I said, damn. I said, let me drop this money off. I went around one of my girl's house right around the corner. I said, huh, hold on to this for me. And she grabbed it, and I jumped in my truck, and, I, and, and as soon as I got to Newport, looked down the street, they was all in front of the house. But there was no drugs. Nothing, nobody. wasn't nothing in there. It wasn't anything in there so then. The drugs and the soul, you just Every, took it yeah, I took everything out. I said, oh, shit. So when is this? This is like summer 84? Yeah, this is still in the summer 84 here. Still in the summer 84. And uh, I had a buddy named Boogaloo. Willie Driscoll. Yeah, Willie Driscoll. I had a buddy named him. He had started smoking. He had branched off from me. He used to help me hold the weed spot down and everything. Started, he helped me help, uh, hold the cocaine spot down a little bit but he wanted to go on his own. So I, th I don't know what I paid him, three, four, five, six thousand dollars, and he went on his own. But he found a spot over on Drexel. And the spot was doing pretty good. And, uh, but he had started smoking. And so he wanted, to, he wanted me to buy the spot out for him. So since he was a friend of mine, I think I gave him like $15,000. I went what over. What do you mean by buy the spot out? Like, take it out, take over this right. one time fee. Fee and he gone. He gone. So I went over there, checked it out. It was a two-family flat. He had the up and down stairs, really. And, uh, and while we was up there talking, his and brother... all this stuff was in this one little square neighborhood. Yeah, it was all in the same gray street, went that far from uh, Newport. And so his brother was there, and we was all up there talking, man, and I was like, uh, where Boogaloo at? We was upstairs. And uh, somebody looked around, they went in the kitchen. They said, man, he done jumped out the kitchen window. He had, high? yeah, he was high. He was, and he got when he got high, he got paranoid. I didn't seen him do that. He'd be like, all you know, bagging up and get up against the wall and walk the wall down and all that type of stuff, you know. But he had dived out the window and took off running. So the next day we didn't open up there. So now we booming and everything. And uh, where, where are you getting the cocaine from? I'm getting it from Terry. I'm getting it from. At what price? Uh. I think it was still 2,800 uh, an ounce. So you're just buying it ounces at a time? Buying it at ounces at a time. And How, like one a day or something? A couple of days? One a day, two a day, three a day, something like that. But this particular day, I bought 16 of them from them. About like almost a half a kilo. It was a half a kilo pound, so to yeah. speak. I bought 16 ounces from them, and we in there cooking it up. so. Because I was tired of just going through this whole process and everything. And, uh, and when we got done, it was my responsibility to take it from there to another location, but I fell asleep. 
And when I fell asleep, they woke me up telling me that we was getting raided upstairs into the spot that I had got from Boogaloo, but we had a spot downstairs. And I was like, damn. And I'm looking out the window, I'm seeing the police is all outside, going in and out, woo, 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 this. And my brother was in there with me too, the one that he smoked. He didn't went from, hair, from Danny. Danny, he didn't went from the pills, from the hair run, I mean from hair run to the pills, you know, uh, to the cocaine. And he, and he said, man, I think we need to flush this. And I'm saying to myself, you know, this is a, uh, what was it, about 300 and some thousand dollars, 400 and some thousand dollars worth of cocaine I had. And dying, so I'm saying to myself, man, we cannot flush this. He said, man, they might come in. I said, they don't have no reason to come in. I said, just quit panicking and sit down because everybody was like jumping around as every footstep they heard. And then, then I seen them leaving. They was fit to leave. And then the people kept outside telling them, y'all some stupid motherfuckers. Y'all busted the wrong house. They live downstairs. They downstairs now. Woo, woo, woo. And I got my Jeep outside. And my Jeep. Who said that? The neighbors? Yeah, just people that was congregating outside looking at the raid. And I had a Jeep outside, you know, with the big tires on and everything. I forgot what football player I had bought this Jeep from. It was a foot, famous football player then that uh, sold his Jeep oh, to this dealership. Oh, played for the Lions? Yeah, played for the Lions that, that sold their Jeep to this dealership, and they sold oh. it to me. Oh, okay. And, uh, and then one of the guys said, I heard him say, I'm going back in. And, the, and his boss said, man, you cannot go back in that house. He said, you want to see? And he snatched away from him and these took are the cops. These are the cops outside. I'm looking at it. He said, I'm going in. He snatched away from him and he started heading back around the house to go to the front. Then the guy said, Hey man, y'all put y'all stuff back on. We going in. Just like that. And Hold up my little sales force and how are you running it on a day to day basis? Well, you know what actually happened? When I came back in late 84, what actually happened were I didn't have any money when I came back because all, everything I left, they had kind of ran through it. And my buddy Fly Guy gave me like six ounces. He gave me like six ounces of crack. And my friend, who I got a baby by his sister, Diane, oh, his tiger. tiger, he was telling me about everybody that they owed. Fly Guy owed, my brother owed in the streets and this and that. And they was also, they wanted to get paid and they also wanted to work. Oh, old workers. The workers. They also wanted to work. So I met some of them, and I told them, check this out. I said, I ain't got no money to pay you, but I will pay you. I said, just give me a few days. I told them, just like, just give me a few days, I'll take care of you. And I'm going to put you in these spots, and I want y'all to hold it down for me. And, man, they went in them spots, man, and they put work in. I mean, within days, I probably was on like a couple of keys off that little $6,000 he gave me. And so I, I took that one key, hooked it up. I don't even remember what I hooked it up to, but whatever it, it did, I paid everybody. And I didn't owe them. If, if it was, they said that my brother, a fly guy, owed them 2800 or $3,500 or $4,500, I was getting to them in crack. It was in the spots. Here you go. Sell this right here. They go, you'll pay. They go, you'll pay. They go, you'll pay. And then my crew even got big. They like, man, be back, man. Y'all yeah, want to work. No, what about, was that the violence hadn't started between, no. like? No violence really started, ever, for real. You know, we had some, some instances where things happened to certain peoples and stuff like that. But just real violence that was bought on us, it was to a minimum. Was it going on around you? Or? Yes. Yeah, we was hearing other people getting taken out. You know, like, for instance, it was a friend of mine. He dated the girl next door to me. And he had ran off with somebody's stuff, which I didn't know. And he just kept begging me. He said, B, I need a job bad, man. He said, I got to get some money. And I kept telling him, I said, man, I don't need anybody right now. You know? I don't need anybody. But this one particular night he came, came and said, man, can you help me, B? And I said, look, man. I said, give me a couple of days, man. If I get a spot, man, I'm going to look out for you. And I remember him leaving. And he left. And, and later on that day, the people next door told me some people, he had ran off with some people's sack, and they caught him on French Road or somewhere and shot him, shot him in the back of the head and left him. You know, but that's the type of things that I would be hearing about. I, got, I learned a lot from my brother. On one occasion, somebody blew up one of our spots. And Danny happened to be over my house one day. 
And the guy came in and said, man, they blew the spot up. This spot was making about ten or 15000 a day. And they knew it was the guys down the streets because they, was, they weren't able to make any money because of this spot. And they was like, man, you know, uh, I got my peoples ready, and, uh, and we're going to go over there and blow their shit up tonight. And so my brother heard it. So he came in there. He said, uh, check this out, bro. He said, uh, only thing I want to tell you, you know, you, you your own man, you know, you do what you got to do. He said, but uh, if you blow up one house, you got to keep on blowing them up now. And so I thought about that. I was like, damn, I don't feel like blowing motherfucking houses up all the time. You know, I'm trying to make money. Yeah. He said, so, so it's up to you. I said, so I told dude, I said, don't worry about it right now. I said, let me just think about that. And I let that slid. And I learned in the long run that you can't make money beefing with people. Now, the best friends never, they didn't enter the, uh, the scene until I was taking a downfall, actually. Actually, with him, what happened with him? Uh, you didn't really know him that well. No, no, none of us, not, well, I was real young when he was going back and forth to jail. But what had happened were I had a friend. Y'all might be a little too young to remember a milkman and a juice man. I mean, I know what they are. Okay, yeah, we had a milkman and a juice man. You know, I had met doing my my drug trade. He used to come over my house and get high and kick it with me and bring me my juices and milks in the little containers. Old fashioned thing, you know, you that was well, a rarity. Little, we used to in Hammersburg, we got we got home juice. Yeah, home juice and all that. And kicking it. And for some reason he just bought up that he had four or five houses and asked me that I wanted to buy one of them. And I said, you know, ask him where and I asked my brother would he go check one of them out. He said, man, he came back and said, man, this is a nice little two family flat on Nodale and uh, Drashit, right across from McDonald's. So I asked him how much did he want to let it go for, he told me $4,500. So at this time, Detroit's clearing out. People are just giving houses away. They giving that shit away, man. It was a nice two-family flat, man. And uh, you wanted it to sell drugs out. No, you know, not actually. Just to have. Really, he was a friend of mine. You know, you want to get rid of it, man, I got some bread. You know, fuck it, I'll buy it from him, man. Because he's spending it right back with me. Anyway. anyway. So it wouldn't hurt me none you know, to look out for him, you know, and he bring me my juice, he was delivering it over there too, you know. But that was the spot that my brother Marlo, eventually when he got out, started staying there. So he moved in over there. What made him come to Detroit? Because you were here and went You know, school. I think he came to Detroit, man, because I, they probably didn't want him in Arkansas. You know, it wasn't nothing in Arkansas, you know. But I can't just testify to why, what was his true motive for man, arriving there? Your brothers were doing okay, heard you were doing good. You know what, I can't, you know what, man, I can't even say that. You know, he used to send money to us when he was in prison. Oh, that's right, I read that he really save up money while he was yeah, in prison. I, I, I have. That's so pretty amazing. He signed a 50 You know, money. look, uh, I remember one day, I, I, you know, you know, I'm say I was rich, you know. Then I didn't look at it, I was rich. But I had plenty of money. I remember my mom's calling me saying that she just got $600 in the mail from him. And he had told her exactly how much money to give each one of us. And I basically was like, you're like, for real? You know, <laughs> you know that, was, that, that was my impression, like, for real? Well, he sent that home from prison. Yeah, sent it home from prison. What the hell was he doing in prison to make money? Oh, you know, well, you know, since I've been in prison, I, I can tell you all about that. You know, because I used to make plenty of money. You know, I had a buddy. In prison, you just give me five thousand a month, every month, five thousand. So you know that wasn't anything. You know what I'm saying now? Yeah, yeah, just big. Yeah. No, wasn't nothing coming in. It was just simply one day, uh, I was outside talking to some friends. One of my buddies walked up to me because I had burnout telephones. You know where you have a phone in somebody's house, and you call, run the phone bill up to a thousand or two thousand dollars when they when they sent you a a bill saying that if you don't pay this much, they're gonna turn it off. You just transfer that phone out of the house to a vacant house, have a phone somewhere else and transfer it back into that house and you just keep going. So when I was outside at, on the yard talking. Oh, well, wait, let's, let's come back to that. Okay. Okay, let's stay back in 80, 85. Okay. So, you're, so it was 85 the year you really, this legend of BJ developed, like how much were you making a day? What was going on? Hell, we probably making, um, 150, 200,000. In cash. In cash. Every day. And, um. Hey, we're, we're still interviewing here. I'll call you when we're done. Is that cool? 
And so uh, my brother was here. So. So you're making 150,000 a day. Yeah, sometimes less, sometimes more. In how many spots? Well, at one, I'm, this is the story. You know how you hear that we had hundreds of spots? We never had hundreds of spots. No. Never. The most that I ever remember we having was maybe 22 or 27. And man, and well, that. You had 22, but you really no, did at no. one time? At one time, but it was so much headache that I said. That is like running a fucking 2500. 22 to 27. And it was so much headache that I told them that whenever a spot shut down, don't open it again. Because I wanted to reduce it to a manageable level. Because if we needed so much workers, you know, we you know we had guns. What was what was the biggest hassle? The workers getting the workers more than the, you could get the cocaine. It was getting with the workers that would stay, you know. And and as we start getting more houses, we need more workers. So we, now we got people that were that we thought we could trust that was running off. And, and, and again, just to, the the availability of cocaine. I mean, the price is slowly coming down, and but also you're always. In 1979, you had to, might not even be able to get any cocaine if you, you know, but by mm -hmm. 85, 86, it's just. It's plentiful. It was plentiful then. It was coming in heavy. You know, you know, you know, you had people like me with street sellers. Then you had people like Perry, Wood, Twin, and on and on was, was Did dealing. Did you ever interact with Demetrius Holloway or Maserati Rick or anything? No. Only interaction that I, I never had any act, any action with uh, Demetrius Holloway, but my twin brother was locked up with him. Oh, in the feds. In the feds, and my and my twin brother also hung with Maserati Rick on the street. They, they, Maserati Rick used to come to my store oh. all the time. I never kicked it with him. Oh, that's right. Tell us. There's so many things to talk about. Briefly, didn't the store help you blow up, or the store was when you were still just selling weed? Just still selling weed. Okay, so the store is not that big. It, it wasn't no big issue. Yeah, all that was just, you know. Okay, so yeah. you're, when your brother comes to town, summer 85, you're...